So today we will talk about uh, the diabetic uh, ketoacidosis. It is one of uh, a very important uh, complication that we see uh, in uh, diabetic patients. Uh, we will see uh, the introduction, the pathophysiology, the clinical findings, the diagnosis, the treatment and the complication. These are the subheadings in which uh, we will discuss this uh, diabetic ketoacidosis. The diabetic ketoacidosis or DKA is a potentially life-threatening complication in people with diabetes mellitus. It, happy, it happens predominantly in those with type 1 diabetes because in type 1 diabetes the insulin secretion is almost zero. But it can occur in those with type 2 diabetes under certain circumstances. We will see those uh, circumstances later on. The DKA results from a shortage of insulin. In response to the body, switches to the burning fatty acids and producing uh, ketones that causes most of the symptoms and the complications. Because there is absence of insulin, the carbohydrate cannot be metabolized and therefore the uh, uh, fat is used and uh, during that metabolism, the ketones are produced. So the diabetic keto ketoacidosis or DKA is an acute life threatening condition. Uh, and uh, it is also seen in 10 to 30 percent of patients with type 2. Whenever a type 2 patient uh, uh, passes through some stress or surgery or infection, there are all the chances that this patient can also land up into a diabetic ketoacidosis. So this is a normal balance between the insulin and other hormones. Insulin is an anabolic hormone, the other hormones are catabolic. The catabolic hormones are glucagon, catecholamine, cortisol and growth hormones. So whenever this uh, balance is not maintained properly, that is uh, uh, insulin, uh, is reduced or insulopenia or insulin is, is zero and other organs, uh, other hormones are increased. Uh, this leads to imbalance and which causes the diabetic ketoacidosis. It is defined as presence of all of the three. There should be hyperglycemia, that means that the glucose should be more than 250 milligram uh, deciliter. There should be ketosis, there should be presence of ketone inside the urine and blood and there should be acidosis, the pH should be less than 7.3. Whenever all these three criteria are there, then and then you can diagnose a ketoacidosis. Suppose this patient is only having hyperglycemia and coma. This we call hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state and coma. This is not a diabetic ketoacidosis. Whenever the sugar is very high, 500, 600, but there is no acidosis, there is no ketones present, we call it a hyperosmolar coma. Impact glucose tolerance, diabetes, stress hyperglycemia, this all can cause the hyperglycemia, but without the presence of acidosis and ketosis, we cannot stamp it as DKA. There are other metabolic acidotic states to lactic acidosis. Suppose the patient is um, on metformin and he is under some stress, some uh, infection, then that patient can land up into acidosis, but this is lactic acidosis. In this uh, patient, the pH can be in acidic range, but the ketones will be absent and the lactic acid level will be very high. Hyperchloremic acidosis, uremic acidosis, drug-induced acidosis like salicylate, the methanol poisoning, we all know the adulterated spirit can cause it, uh, ethylene glycerol, this all can cause acidosis, this is metabolic acidosis causes, but in here, hyperglycemia is not there, ketones are not there, so this is not a DKA. There are some uh, situations in, in which the ketones are raised, like ketotic hypoglycemia, alcoholic ketosis, starvation ketosis. Whenever the patient is on prolonged starvation, suppose the patient is on hunger strike, he is doing fasting, a prolonged fasting uh, in some religion uh, some the some of the saints like in jain saints to the santharo they just uh, die because of the starvation and when the prolonged starvation is there there will be presence of the ketones because there is no carbohydrate so whatever fat is there in the body it will be used and the metabolism so there will be ketones but there will be no acidosis there will be no hyperglycemia and this is not a decay so there should be presence of hyperglycemia, that is sugar more than 250, there should be a presence of acidosis and there should be presence of ketones and when all the three are combined, then and then we can call the patient is in diabetic ketoacidosis. The role of insulin is required for transport of glucose into the muscle, adipose tissue and liver. So uh, for the metabolism of glucose, for the maintenance of normal blood glucose level, insulin is a very uh, important hormone. When the insulin is uh, secreted, it uh, inhibits the lipolysis, so there is no uh, uh, lysis of the lipids. In the absence of insulin, the glucose accumulates in the blood. We all know that whenever there is absence of insulin, the blood glucose rises. Therefore, we call it diabetes hyperglycemia. And for the rise of this blood sugar, where the, from where this blood sugar comes, it from the amino acids, that is called gluconeogenesis. 
it converts the fatty acids into the ketone bodies that is acetoacetate and beta hydroxybutyrate so whenever there is an absence of the insulin three things happens the glucose comes into the blood from the muscles and the liver the what we call glycogenolysis and the proteins are converted into glucose by a process called gluconeogenesis and fatty acids are metabolized when they produce the ketone bodies what we uh, they are named as acetoacetate and beta hydroxybutyrate so whenever there is uh, insufficiency of the insulin the fat cells causes the metabolism of uh, the fatty acids and they produce the beta hydroxybutyric acid and acetoacetic acid uh, amino acids uh, are cleaved and they produce uh, the glucose by the process of uh, gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis is uh, ha happening and therefore the glycogen is converted glycogen is converted into the glucose so there is increased glucose increased ketones inside the blood so there is hyperglycemia uh, it causes the osmotic diuresis the osmotic value of the serum and blood rises because of the high blood sugar level and this causes a profound diuresis uh, we all know that the diabetes is uh, we, we call it the polydipsia polyphagia and um, polysomnia this uh, polydipsia is because of the diuresis because of the high blood sugar level uh, dehydration sets on that causes the pre renal azotemia, what we call the pre renal failure, also the ketone formation and wide ion ion gap metabolism. I don't go into the details because this is the subject of acidosis and alkalosis, so we will not discuss it late uh, in detail. But this is a wide ion ion gap metabolic acidosis. So, what are the symptoms of diabetic ketoacidosis? Whenever a diabetic patient presents to you with severe nausea, vomiting the patient cannot retain anything inside the uh, abdomen whatever he eats or she eats uh, is vomited out uh, it must be a decay uh, increased thirst polyuria patient is passing too much amount of the urine abdominal pain shortness of breath patient is feeling dizzy if you see the patient's uh, signs the tachycardia the pulse rate is very high 110 and 20 uh, dehydration uh, hypotension tachypnea with small breathing because this is acidotic breathing so patient will take a very rapid and shallow breathing what we call the kusmal breathing respiratory distress the fruity order in breath is very very important uh, you all must have uh, smelled the um, nail polish remover that is the acetone this order is same and uh, if uh, you make a habit you can never miss a case of diabetic ketoacidosis because uh, this patient has this typical breath um, uh, this typical smell in the breath abdominal tenderness uh, so many patients of diabetic ketoacidosis are misinterpreted by some surgeons as acute abdomen, acute appendicitis, but they are the case of the DK who presents as acute abdomen. And very important thing is one should rule out acute pancreatitis whenever the patient is in DK. One of the cause of DK can be acute pancreatitis, lethargy, uh, obtundation, cerebral edema causing uh, all the problems and the patient can land up into coma also. So mainly the polyuria the malaise the polyphagia the polydipsia lethargy are all because of the hyperglycemia the tachycardia the hypotension the poor skin trigger the dry mucous membrane the shrunken eye all are because of the volume depletion and dehydration and the acidosis causes the nausea the vomiting the abdominal pain the altered, altered mental status uh, the muscular pains the cardiac problems the respiratory problems the tachypnea the confusion is all because of the acidosis so what is the etiology of diabetic ketoacidosis a diabetic patient, whenever he or she has an infection, the pneumonia, the urinary tract infection, the gastroenteritis, sepsis, whenever the infection is there, the insulin requirement of the body is high. And gradually, the uh, related insulin deficiency happens and this causes the decay. So, inadequate insulin administration, when suppose the patient missed the dose of the insulin or if the patient is on insulin pump, the set of the insulin pump is blocked or there is some problem in the insulin uh, delivery in the pump, or suppose that insulin the patient is taking is not of a proper quality patient uh, the insulin was not stored properly insulin is always a heat level so suppose that vial is exposed to the heat and the uh, insulin is not uh, proper then this miss dose or a miss uh, uh, there is something problem in the insulin delivery can cause the inadequate insulin uh, rec uh, delivered to the patient this can cause the decay uh, cerebral infarction, coronary infarction, mesenteric infarction or peripheral gangrene uh, infarction of the muscles in the limbs can cause diabetic ketoacidosis. Some of the drugs like cocaine, if a patient is uh, addicted to cocaine, 
that can also cause the diabetic ketoid. So, so one of the very important causes is pregnancy because in pregnancy, the insulin requirement of the patient goes high. So this patient can land up into a diabetic ketoacidosis. Now if we see the pathophysiology, the insulin deficiency will cause some problem. The glucose uptake inside the cells will be uh, less. So there will be more glucose inside the blood, what we call the hyperglycemia. This hyperglycemia will call the osmotic diuresis. There will be too much of the uh, uh, excretion of the sodium uh, and all the electrolytes and water, which leads to the dehydration. The insulin deficiency also causes the proteolysis, what we call the gluconeogenesis. This increases the amino acid um, uh, uh, level. And this in turn is converted into a glucose causing the hyperglycemia. Another thing is that this uh, deficiency of the insulin causes the glycogenolysis in the liver. So glycogen is converted into the glucose, the hyperglycemia causing the osmotic diuresis. The main problem causing the uh, rise in ketones is lipolysis. This lipolysis will increase the free fatty acids as well as the glycerol. The glycerol will again polyurize the amino acid and in turn will cause the hyperglycemia. The free fatty acids are converted into ketones in the liver. So beta hydroxybutyric acid and acetoacetic acid rises causing the acidosis falls in the pH in the blood. So diabetic ketoacidosis arises because of the lack of insulin, the lack of insulin and corresponding elevation of other hormones that is the glucogen, glucagon, corticosteroids, growth hormones. They causes the increased level of glucose in the liver and what we call the glycogenolysis. The glycogen is converted into glucose and amino acids are converted into glucose called the gluconeogenesis. These high glucose levels spill over into the urine taking water and solutes like sodium and potassium with it on causing all the electrolyte problems and this leads to polyuria, dehydration and compensatory thirst and polydipsia. Because uh, the patient is in dehydration there will be high thirst and there will be polydipsia. The absence of insulin also leads to the release of free fatty acids from adipose tissue lipolysis which are converted through a process called beta oxidation again in the liver into ketone bodies that is acetoacetate and beta hydroxybutyrate. Beta hydroxybutyrate can serve as an energy source in the absence of insulin uh, and mediated glucose delivery and it is a protective mechanism. Now these ketones are not bad. You all must be knowing that some people are following keto diets for weight loss. These ketones is a protective mechanism. When the insulin is not there, body has to get some energy. So these ketones are utilized by mainly brain to stay active in absence of insulin when it cannot utilize the glucose. The ketone bodies, however, have a low pKa and therefore turn the blood acidic because these are the uh, metabolic, uh, these are the acids. Therefore, it causes the metabolic acidosis. The body initially buffers the change with the bicarbonate buffering system. The body has a very beautiful uh, pH maintaining system. Whenever there is, there is acidosis, there is maintenance of pH. First, whenever the acidosis happens, the bicarbonate is utilized, but it got exhausted very fast. Now the compensatory mechanism, mechanism in form of respiratory alkalosis starts. There is a metabolic acidosis. The body uh, uh, try to maintain the pH by a respiratory alkalosis. And how to do a respiratory alkalosis by CO2 washout. So how the body can wash out the CO2 by rapid breathing. Whenever the body starts breathing rapidly because of the hyperventilation, the CO2 is washed out, carbonic acid levels drops, the pH rises. So this is the compensatory mechanism, the respiratory alkalosis to maintain the pH to a normal level. So diagnosis, the most important is clinical. You see the patient, this patient is diabetic, he is in um, stress. Uh, he is tachypneic, he is in shock, he is in tachycardia, then most probably the patient is in decay. Look at the precipitating events. What causes the elevated glucose? Pregnancy, infection, omission of insulin. Ask to the relatives whether the patient is not taking insulin since few days, whether the patient is in stress, if a kid is type 1, whether the exam is approaching, whether the exam is going on, uh, myocardial infarction, central nervous system problems. What caused this event? Assess hemodynamic status, look at the pulse, look at the respiration, look at the BP, examine, the, examine for the presence of infection. If the infection focus is there, if you don't remove that focus, the patient will not come out of the decay. So if the limb is having problem, you have to do the debridement. If there is a gangrene, you have to do the amputation. Assess the volume status. If the patient is in dehydration, first correct the dehydration. We don't want to correct the sugar very rapidly. The main problem is dehydration. And so always look at the degree of the dehydration, assess the, assess the presence of ketonemia and acid-based disturbances. 
so as we saw previously the diagnostic criteria is blood sugar more than 250 uh, uh, metabolic acidosis that means the anion gap is more than 10 we don't go into the detail detail bicarbonate less than 15 ph less than 7.3 and presence of ketone in blood and urine now how to check the presence of ketone well taking blood drawing blood sending it to the laboratory takes time just put a catheter inside the patient is unconscious just put a catheter collect the sample uh, drip the ketone strip and you will get the black color if the ketone strips are not available suppose in a you are in a remote place there are always acetone powders available you put that urine on sprinkle it on the acetone powder it will turn black and that uh, degree of uh, darkening of that powder determines plus one plus two plus three ketones inside the urine as uh, we discussed previously the differential diagnosis are always alcoholic ketoacidosis starvation ketoacidosis renal failure can also cause metabolic acidosis and lactic acidosis it's very important whenever a diabetic patient comes to you is your acetone the acid ketones are present that doesn't mean the patient is in ketoacidosis there has to be associated hyperglycemia if the ketones are only present and the hyperglycemia is not there blood glucose is low there are all the chances the patient is in starvation ketoacidosis and giving insulin to such patient can kill the patient so one has to be very very cautious so whenever you do lab just do rapid bedside glucose determination just do a finger pricking by the glucometers urine strip for ketones ecg for hyperkalemia cbc for hp and total count when the total counts is high uh, CRP is high, it always shows that patient is having infection. But remember, in every case of ketoacidosis, you will get some form, uh, some uh, leukocytosis without infection also. Same serum electrolyte, because all type of electrolyte will be deranged and it can cause severe problems. Blood urea and serum creatinine for kidney function, urine analysis for osmolarity, pH and ketones, um, blood gas analysis as well as for the um, pH of uh, the blood. Calculate the anion gap, not important at this level, so we will not go into the details. And send the blood culture. If, the, if you are suspecting any infection, it is a dictum that before starting the antibiotics, the clinician should send the blood culture so you get the proper culture and sensitivity report for future management. And uh, as I said, the ABG for acid base balance. So serum glucose, electrolytes in which the sodium, potassium, chloride, magnesium, calcium, phosphate, bicarb levels, amylase and lipase to rule out the pancreatitis urine dipstick, ketone levels, serum and capillary beta-hydroxybutyrate levels. This is the see why the serum um, uh, acetone levels are important because some drugs like aspirin and vitamin C can uh, do some uh, problem with the urine ketone levels and sometimes it's difficult to obtain the urine in an unconscious patient. So in that case, you can go directly to the serum level of the uh, ketones. ABG measurements, CBC, B1 and ACG as we discussed uh, previously. Imagings are not much important, but if you are suspecting pneumonia, get the chest x-ray. If you are suspecting the patient is having severe stroke, patient is comatose to rule out some specific lesions or hemorrhage, you can go for the CT or MRI when the patient is unconscious. Treatment of decay, the initial hospital management is replace fluid. First dictum is replace fluid in electrolytes. We are not concerned with acidosis. We are not concerned with hyperglycemia. Our first focus is fluid. Second is electrolytes. IV insulin therapy because without supplementing the insulin, which is deficient, you cannot uh, reverse the diabetic keto ketoacidosis. So give fluid, give electrolytes, start insulin, watch for complications and treat the causes. These should be the four principles. Fluid, electrolyte, insulin, watch for complications and treat the causes. Once resolved, convert to home insulin regimen and prevent recurrence. Whenever the patient has come out of the diabetic ketoacidosis, the patient should be put on the home insulin therapy. Suppose the type 2 patient was on oral hypoglycemic agents, it's advisable to discharge the patients on subcutaneous insulin regime and not to start oral hypoglycemic right away because this can again cause the recurrence of the diabetic ketoacidosis. It's a very busy chart, so I have divided into a few parts so to make it uh, uh, easy. The management of adult patients with decay, you just first do initial evolution and start IV fluids. That is 1 liter of 0.9% sodium chloride per hour. That is 15 to 20 ml per kg. Just imagine that the patient is waiting around 50 kg. 
then this will be 1 liter per hour. So you see, you are giving 1 liter of NS sodium, normal saline pint, every hour for few hours. So at least for 6 to 7 hours, we are going to give 6 to 7 liters of fluid. It's a very high fluid. So initially, we have to give 8 to 10 liters of fluid at the rate of this 1 liter per hour. That is 15 to 20 ml per kg per hour. So principle is IV fluids, insulin, potassium, and need for bicarbonates. This is always a controversial. We will see later on. So IV fluids determine the hydration status. It is if it is a shock, just give fast fluid. Don't wait. Just give fluid, fluid, fluid every time. You can push the fluid with the BP apparatus, with the BP cuff. You can push the fluid with your hands, but give plenty of fluid. Always insert a um, uh, high bore needle like 18 gauge intracat so that the fluid delivery becomes easy. Whenever there is a mild hypotension, you evaluate the, the serum sodium level. If the serum sodium is high, then you can give point the half strength sodium chloride pints. If serum sodium is normal, you can still give half strength. But if it is low, then you can give the hypertonic saline. This is very, very important. If the patient is hyponatremic, if the serum sodium is 110, 120, then you can always consider the hypertonic saline. Otherwise, the normal strength of saline will do the job in 80% of the cases. If serum sodium is high or serum sodium is normal, you can use the normal um, sodium chloride pint, that is the NS pint in these patients. If the patient is in cardiogenic shock, then we have to do the hemodynamic moni dynamic monitoring and the patient should be monitored very closely. Insulin. Well, if IV excess is there and it has to be there because we are giving plenty of pints, dictum is give IV insulin. No one prefer this sub-Q and IM regime now because the patient is in shock. You give sub-Q, we don't know how much of this insulin will get absorbed into the systemic circulation. So this sub-Q and IM regime is out. If the patient IV excess you cannot get uh, even after the multiple attempts, you can try the IM route. The dose is 0.15 unit per kg as IV bolus because we are dealing with a very uh, high blood sugar level and the patient is totally insulopanic. You give the 0.15 unit per kg as IV bolus. Suppose a patient is weighing 50 kg, you have to give 7 to 8 unit as IV bolus and then you start 0.1 unit per kg per hour IV insulin infusion. So what we do is we dissolve the 40 units of insulin you all know the vial comes as 40 units per ml. So 1 ml insulin, 39 unit of saline. So that makes the 40 unit, 40 ml. We put it in the infusion pump and we start at this 1, 0.1 unit per kg per hour. So that will be around 5 units per hour in 50 kg patients. So around 5 ml per hour insulin infusion, 40 ml in uh, 40 units in 40 ml. If serum glucose does not fall by 50 to 70 milligram per deciliter in first hour. So after starting this 0.1 unit per kg per hour infusion, you have to measure the blood sugar after one hour. If it has not dropped to 50 to 70. So what we started the insulin infusion at 300 milligram uh, blood sugar level. If it doesn't drop below 250, then we have to double the insulin, the dose. That means it was 0.1 unit per kg per hour. We make it 0.2 unit per kg per hour until the drop is 50 to 70 milligram per deciliter hourly. So you start with 0.1 unit per kg per hour. Then you check the blood sugar after an hour. It should fall by 50 to 70 milligram per deciliter. If it doesn't fall like this, you double the dose and again check the sugar after one hour. It should fall to 50 to 70 and you go on increasing the dose till the blood sugar reaches a level where the hypoglycemia starts at that time. What to do? We will see. When the blood glucose reaches 250, you change to 5% dextrose with that is DNS pint or the dextrose with uh, 0.45 NSEL pint whenever the blood sugar is 150 to 250. So when the blood sugar is now decreasing, you have to reduce the dose to 0.05 to 0.1 unit per kg per hour. At the same time, you have to also administer blood glucose, the glucose containing pints so that the patient doesn't go into the hypoglycemia. And you keep a strict vigilant over the blood sugar level with the finger prick glucometer readings. 
and H, you keep the blood sugar between 150 to 250 that is adequate we don't want 100 110 no it is not because the hypoglycemia can cause more problems check the electrolytes bun creatinine every two to four hour until it's stable after the resolution of dk the patient is uh, taking orally then you can continue IV insulin and supplement with regular, uh, uh, regular insulin when needed. And when the patient is eating properly, you can go on to the sub-Q regimes and discharge the patient on sub-Q regime after two to three days of the admission when the patient is stabilized. A golden principle is whenever the patient comes to you with DK, the management should be so prompt and so effective that the patient should come out within 24 hours. The patient should be out of DK within 24 hours. The potassium hypokalemia is a very dreaded complication. If serum potassium is less than 3.3, you have to hold the insulin because the, when you give the insulin, it drives the potassium intracellularly. So the extracellular potassium will drop. So we have to uh, stop the insulin for a few, uh, uh, few minutes or few hours and uh, give the potassium supplementation. If the serum potassium is more than 5, don't give potassium, but keep on checking. If serum potassium is three more than 3.3 but less than 5, give to 20 to 30 milli equivalent potassium in every liter of IV fluids because whatever the insulin you are going to give is going to cause the hypokalemia. So principle is if the serum potassium level is normal, you give potassium supplement in each pint. If it is high, don't give and you keep on checking because it is going to fall because you are giving insulin. If it is too low, then you have to give a high potassium supplementation in each pint and you have to control the insulin infusion you have to perhaps stop it for a few minutes so that the severe hypokalemia doesn't set in now the bicarbonate if the ph is too low less than 6.9 some people advocate giving by uh, sodium bicarbonate if ph is more than 7 we don't give if it is 6.9 to 7 we still don't advocate but if it's too low some studies have shown that you can give soda by cup it is a controversial issue but it is better not to give the iv soda by cup in metabolic acidosis because it causes more harm than the benefit the only benefit is if you give this soda by cup at this ph the patient's kusmal breathing will be relieved the tachypnea will be relieved the patient distress will be relieved so the Fluid replacement, administer normal saline as indicated to maintain the hemodynamic status. Um, NS for the first four hours, consider half strength uh, NS that is 0.25 thereafter. Normal strength is 0.45, half strength is 0 uh, 0.25 and hypertonic is 0 0.9. Whenever the glucose falls below, blood glucose falls below 250, you can change the patient on DNS pint that is dextrose plus normal saline pint. Uh, insulin management this is always a regular insulin you all uh, know that uh, insulins are uh, the regular insulin the analogs you can always give the fast acting analogs like glargin like aspart in the case of dk because they are short acting you can still give iv but most of the clinicians prefer the regular insulin 10 unit iv state for adults that is 0 0.15 unit per kg iv state and then we give 1.1 unit per kg per hour up to 5 units per hour. Suppose it is the that is 5 units per hour. Sorry, if the patient is waiting 50 kg, then we measure the blood sugar every one and uh, one to two hour. And if the fall is not uh, 70 to 80 milligram percentage, we increase the we double the dosage. We then once the patient is stabilized, we decrease the insulin by one to two unit per hour. That is 0 0.0.05 to 0 0.1 unit per kg per hour when the glucose level reaches less than 250 so first we started the insulin as 0.1 uh, unit per kg then we see we monitored the blood glucose it should come down to 70 to 80 milligram percentage every hour if when it reaches around 250 we have to reduce the dosage of 1 to 2 unit per hour so that the hypoglycemia doesn't set in if it is very low you can stop the insulin infusion for few hours few minutes but it's better that you continue the insulin in low dosage and you start the dextrose infusion so that the patient doesn't go into the hypoglycemia as well as the low dose of the insulin infusion uh, also uh, uh, helps the patient to come out of the DK. Don't decrease the insulin infusion to less than 1 unit per hour. Suppose we are giving uh, 0.1 unit per kg that is around uh, in 50 kg it is 5 unit. 
we monitored we reached up to 10 units 15 units now the patient is becoming settled uh, uh, settling blood sugar is uh, getting down then you reduce the insulin by 1 to 2 unit per hour 15 atu we make it 13 we want it make it 12 and we see the blood sugar level every hourly and we should not reduce in a um, uh, less than 1 unit per hour so this is the minimum dose we will uh, continue giving to this patient and maintain the glucose between 140 to 180 if the blood sugar decreases to less than 80 if the patient is going into severe hypoglycemia we can always stop the insulin infusion for few uh, minutes and uh, we can again restart when the blood sugar rises to 140 to 180 uh, if the glucose drops consistently to less than 100 milligram change to d10 or d5 or dns so that we can maintain the blood glucose level between 140 to 180 once the patient is able to eat and retain there is no vomiting we can consider changing to the sub -Q insulin but main principle is the patient should be out of the dehydration otherwise the sub -Q insulin will not work overlap the short acting insulin and iv infusion for one to two hour whenever you are starting the sub -Q insulin don't stop the infusion right away you do the overlap of both so that by the time the sub -Q infusion task start acting the, the that gap will be taken care of by the iv infusions for patients with previous insulin dose return to the prior dose of the insulin suppose the patient was taking premix insulin in 20 and 50 units doses 20 before breakfast and 15 before dinner once the patient is settled you count the total requirement total daily requirement how much bolus we gave how much per hour we gave we told we just calculate and according to that we can again shift the patient on the pre-mix uh, dosage for patients with newly diagnosed diabetes it is always better to calculate the full dose insulin divide into two parts 50 percent short acting and 50 percent log acting and discharge the patient with uh, basal bolus regime that are uh, one or two units of the basal and three uh, three shots of the uh, bolus insulin the potassium we already saw kcl is used kpo4 is better but mostly kcl is used because it is widely available and we have to add iv potassium to each liter of fluid administered unless it is contraindicated unless the patient is having severe hypercalemia every normal saline pint we are giving should be having kcl uh, added phosphate controversial we don't touch it the bicarbs as we saw the clinical trials don't support the routine use of bicarbs the bicarb replacement and rapid reversal of acidosis can impair cardiac function, reduce tissue oxygenation and proper promote hypokalemia and hypocalcemia. So it is better to wait for uh, natural collection of, uh, correction of acidosis than giving bic bicarbonate in the patients. However, in presence of severe acidosis, as we saw in previous slide, if the pH is less than 6.9, you can consider giving bicarbs to this patient. Keep a flow sheet, maintain tabulating, mental testers, vital signs, what the insulin dosage you gave, how much fluid you gave, how much electrolyte you gave. What happens? A sister's shift or a staff nurse shift or a resident shift changes and the new person doesn't know what happened in the last 24 hours. So keep a flow chart, how much you give, how much you monitored, what are the changes made, how the patient progress or deteriorated. And uh, the blood glucose level by the glucometer by one or two hour is very important. Electrolytes, especially potassium, bicarbonate and anion gap every four hourly or six hourly for the first 24 hours. Monitor blood pressure, pulse, respiration, fluid intake, input output chart every one to four hour. Once decay has dissolved, most patients will require 0.5 to 0.6 unit per kg per day. That means if the patient is 50 kg, then you have to give 25 to 30 units of insulin per day. Highly insulin resistant patients can go up to 0.8 to 1 unit per kg per day if the patient is very obese or if the patient is having tuberculosis and other problems of insulin resistance, the requirement can go very high. You can go up to 50 units or 60 or 70 units per day. Give subcutaneous insulin at least two hours prior to the weaning of the insulin infusions. As I told you, the overlap between an insulin infusion and sub -Q insulin uh, is very important. The complications of decay is shock. If not improving its fluids, just rule out the MI or pancreatitis, third space fluid collection. 
Vascular thrombosis. This severe dehydration can cause a venous thrombosis in the brain, cerebral vessels, or uh, limb uh, thrombosis causing the gangrene, pulmonary edema, aggressive fluid resuscitation, 7 liters, 10 liters, 15 liters of fluid. It can correct the dehydration, but at the same time, the patient can land up into a pulmonary edema. And this is very important when the patient's left ventricle is compromised, the patient is having CCF, always go slow and just uh, maintain the pure, proper hydration without causing the pulmonary edema. Same way it can also cause the cerebral edema in the first 24 hours. Mental status changes, patient becomes stuporous, comatose or patient becomes disoriented, may require intubation with hyperventilation because the cerebral edema, the best uh, treatment is hyperventilation to wash out the CO2. So the strategies to prevent diabetic ketoacidosis is future is diabetic education. If you have not counseled the patient, if you have not explained what is the importance of taking regular insulin, what will happen if the regular insulin is not taken, the patient will uh, surely go into a diabetic ketoacidosis again in the future. Regular glucose monitoring, sick day management, patient should be taught. Suppose a patient is having fever, patient is having vomiting and one dose of insulin is skipped, there is stress or one plus acetone, what should do? How much bolus he should take home monitoring of ketone every type 1 diabetic patient should have a ketone strip at the home so they can check at odd hours they can check at late nights supplemental short acting regimens should be explained to the patient easily digestible liquid diets when the when the patient is sick they should be taught what they can eat reducing rather than eliminating insulin when patients are not eating this is very important suppose the patient is fasting Suppose this patient is so anorexic that he cannot uh, eat food, then they should be taught that it's important to take at least half unit, one unit, two unit of insulin rather than skipping, skipping the dose altogether because one unit of insulin given can uh, just uh, uh, stop uh, development of the decay. Guidelines for when patients should seek medical attention should be explained to the patient case monitoring of high risk patient and special education for patients on pump management. This is very important. If the patient is on pump, there are set blockage, there are problems with the delivery. So this should be explained to the patient. Uh, that ends my talk. Thank you very much. If there are any problems or queries, you can always uh, put.